Hello everyone and welcome to the latest edition of Pro Soccer Talk. I'm your host Joe Prince right over here in England. Delighted to say I'm joined by Nick Mendola in Buffalo, New York and Andy Edwards in Kansas City. Gents, the Premier League season is here. We are going to preview all 20 teams today. We're going to go through up and down the league and see where each team is at heading into the first weekend of the season. As you can tell, I'm absolutely buzzing, so excited for this. Nick, how are you my friend and how excited are you for the start of the Premier League season? The buzz, Joseph, is palpable. It's powerful. I'm, I'm really excited. And then, uh, so last night I did my whole, well, let me check in on all the Americans and how they did. And like almost all of them, save Josh Sargent Norwich, did great. Uh, and a shout out to one of the better teams in the Northeast, but not the best. Lyndon Gooch with the biggest assist as, Sun assist as Sunderland goes back up into the championship. And it's nice to see them where they belong. That's right. At PST, we focus on everything from the soccer world, not just the Premier League, but USMNT, some really exciting transfer moves for players coming to the Premier League, which we're going to talk about a lot today. And Andy, you were on the site last night, England's women's team bringing home the European Championship, a record crowd for a men's or women's game at a European Championship final, over 87,000 fans inside Wembley. I can tell you here in England, euphoric. That was the feeling today that finally we've won a trophy at the top of the international game. And it was just an incredible sight, right, to see uh, that team celebrate and how good they've been in that tournament over the last month. So how are you, mate? And uh, you must be really looking forward to this season with your Tottenham Hotspur hat on. Uh, didn't the Premier League season just finish? It, it feels like we just had a conversation <laughs> where we said, OK, let's take a little time off, recharge the back. Of course, we did that and everything, but it's come back around so quickly. I, I'm excited. The, the American aspect that you mentioned there, Joe, I think is the big reason for me this season, just because it feels like we're going to get, and especially in a World Cup year, a bit of a referendum on American players in the Premier League okay. because there's such a number of them that there hasn't been. Uh, honestly, for the last yeah. handful of years since we had a bit of an exodus. So I'm excited to see how they get on. Obviously excited to see the title battle once again. Uh, but again, I think one through 20, there's going to be a lot to play for for 38 games for everyone. So, uh, you know, just like last season, can't wait to get started. Absolutely. And Nick, before we get started on previewing uh, the fate of these 20 Premier League clubs this season, Andy mentioned there, USMNT wise, in a World Cup year, just a few months out from Qatar, how excited are you to see these players in action? Because I, I put a post up on Pro Soccer Talk earlier today. Brendan Aronson just looked like the Pennsylvanian De Bruyne with that incredible assist with the outside of yeah. his right foot. Mm. Tyler Adams is locking it down at Leeds. Chris Richards arrived at Crystal Palace. There's some really big moves there for some young US players. So I'm really excited. You are too, right? Yeah, and I know we always talk about form heading into a World Cup and we, you know, the end of the European season and all that. But this time with it being in the thick of a season and guys competing for places, there's something more to it. And we talked about so many. The Premier League especially is great. But uh, when I look at Chris Richards having a chance to not only jump out of the screen, but he will be an undeniable if he gets a chance to get out there and, and earn his place. It will almost be undeniable and difficult now when you start to see, just by virtue of profile, Greg Berhalter, let's say he wanted to play Aaron Long over him or something like that, it becomes pretty difficult when the guy playing in the best league in the world is on everybody's televisions in London, of all places, every single week. So, Although half the league right now is in London, to be fair. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, a lot of South Coast teams, London. There's, yeah, pretty much half the league is London or South right now. But but Andy, I mean, not just from a U.S. perspective, but from the whole Premier League season, this is going to be intriguing, right, to see guys who are battling to get on their national teams ahead of the World Cup. Yeah. Maybe some stars who don't want to get injured that might impact their kind of form mm -hmm. heading the closer we get towards the World Cup. So have you got your eye on that as well in particular? Yeah, of course. I, we look at it so much through that American lens, at least Nick and I do. And I, I know you're up on the U.S. men's national team as well, Joe, uh, save for a, a certain date coming up in, in November, of course. But yeah, I, I think that while a lot of squads are probably settled, uh, there will be a handful of players that maybe they made a transfer in the summer. And we just talked about a bunch of the American players that did that. There will be examples dotted all over the Premier League, I think, and players with their last opportunity to make a case for uh, for the national team for, uh, ahead of the World Cup. It's going to be really strange to play a half of a season and then just hit a hard stop 
shut it down for a month, players go away, and then something for us to be so excited about and watch the World Cup for a month and then come straight back into it. Uh, I, I think there will be a case somewhere. I, I can't tell you where, obviously, but somewhere in the table, something big will be affected, I think, by kind of the stop-start nature of what this season is going to be. Maybe it's an injury at the World mm-hmm. Cup or leading up to the World Cup, uh, but that's certainly going to play a factor in, in, in one or some or all of the races this season. Yeah, I'm really intrigued to see how that plays out because I think it's a huge advantage for some of these smaller teams in the Premier League that may not have a lot of uh, players going to the World Cup to have essentially a whole month of just training from mid-November until Boxing Day when the season restarts to just work on tactical stuff, work on fitness. And the big boys are going to lose a lot of players for a big chunk of time there. So how does that impact uh, the league? We'll wait and see, but let's kick off the focus on the big six, gents, for the Premier League season. Who's going to win the title? Who will finish in the top four? Let's now focus in on those big boys at the top who are expected to be battling it out all season long. Let's start with Manchester United. Nick, I'm going to come to you. Eric Ten Hag's philosophy, it's very clear to see, even during preseason, they've had some positive results overall, even with the Ronaldo saga and the Frankie de Jong saga rumbling on in the background. But what do you think about Manchester United heading into the season? Where are they at under Eric Ten Hag? Or is it kind of just too early to tell right now if they're going to be successful or not? Well, it is too early to tell how successful they're going to be. You know, Andy and I and and you have had this kind of disagreement over the past few months. I think it's unquestioned that they're going to be better. Um, How much better and how quickly they can turn it around. I mean, is Lissandra Martinez going to come in and legitimately potentially keep a Harry Maguire out of the lineup, but Perry Maguire isn't at his best. Um, is Fred reborn? And, and <laughs> I think maybe we may start to view how we viewed Fred in the first place. But the key word you touched on, Joe, is philosophy. Because for two managers now, counting Ralph Ragnick, we didn't quite know what we were getting from them. Uh, there were weird discussions. And again, once Ole started buying into the, I have to play the we're Manchester United and that's why we're going to get better and it must be better. Um, that kind of became his philosophy and that didn't work. Rangnick was kind of put himself in a bad position, was also put in an awkward position. This may be just by virtue of having someone with a steady mind and a clear indication of what he wants to do. An excellent opportunity for Eric Ten Hag to go out there and, uh, and and present the Man- a Manchester United that everybody can kind of get behind and understand. And I think if the fans, even the ones who won't be happy with the progress, if it's not rocket fuel, if they can see that there's a philosophy, he'll get mm. just that little bit more time before all of the pitchforks come out, pun intended. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you there. I think it's just nice for them to see that there is a clear plan and philosophy now um, in terms of the playing style. They haven't really had that, have they? The last few seasons has just been a bit of a mismatch of we have these great players, let's chuck them together. We'll be a counter-attacking team and we'll rely on them to to win points and win games. But but Andy, Nick mentioned there that philosophy, when you look at pre-season and you look at the performances of Anthony Martial, Marcus Rashford, Jaden Sancho, that fluid front three is really a, a hallmark of Eric Ten Hag's team at Ajax that was so successful over the last few seasons. And with the Ronaldo situation, him wanting to leave and and not being around for the whole of preseason, it's actually like it's forced Manchester United to to play without him and they look a lot better for it. Is that a fair argument? And you do think those kind of guys with the World Cup in, in, in the background there for all three of those players I mentioned, they need a really good start to the season as well, right? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because we've been talking about this since last year when the signing was made, and it almost feels like Manchester United have a get-out-of-jail-free card right now. A year early, get out of a contract or a sentence, if you will, and they just don't want to use it. And I don't really understand what the, the, the hesitancy is. I understand the commercial and marketing appeal of having a player of that caliber around and, and, and part of the team and just attached to the name of your club. I get that part of it. But when you look at the way it affected the team on the field last season, where they finished and the fact that they are trying to go in a new direction now, uh, you know, it it seems to make even more sense that you would use this opportunity to get out now while you still can. If if you're the club, I don't know if they're going to do that. Uh, As far as the philosophy goes, it is good to have a philosophy and an identity that you're building towards. I do question, though, and obviously we'll see this play out over the course of the season, but I do question for as many good on ball good passers, good technical players as they have there, 
you kind of have to have the ball all the time to be able to make the most mm-hmm. of that. And, and so I, I question a little bit, where is the, the ball winning going to come from defensively? Uh, I, I think that they will be pretty good in, in, uh, in possession and on the attack. I think they'll score goals. I think mm-hmm. they'll concede a lot of goals though as well, because they've gone from having too many defensive midfielders sitting uh, in, in front of the back line to not really having any ball winners to sit in front of the back line and protect the center backs. If you don't have a good defensive midfielder, especially in the premier league these days, uh, it doesn't matter who your center backs are. They are going to be exposed. They're going to be challenged in ways that you don't want your center backs challenged over the course of a game. So I, I question that part of it. And I don't think De Jong is the fix for that because that's not really the profile player that he is. So I have questions, but obviously a plan in place, they're moving in the right direction for sure. Yeah, and Fred's been sneaky good in preseason as well. So it looks like he's going to be the main man and sort of maybe plays to strengths a little bit better on being a holding midfielder, but also having the license to get a bit further forward and up and down. I think that's the key under Ten Hag, right? Midfield and attack, it's just one fluid unit. Everyone's interchanging. And without Ronaldo, I think that's a lot easier with the other players that they have Mm -hmm. there. I think for Manchester United, Bruno Fernandes, Christian Eriksen, how do they slot those two superstar players in? Smooth on the ball, like you said, Andy. Great at dictating the tempo of the game. But then when they're going the other way and defending towards their own goal, do they have enough players who can... Just shore things up. Dallow's looked really good at right back, right wing back at times during preseason. Uh, Malassia and Luke Shaw will battle it out for the left back spot. Mart- Lissandra Martinez and Harry Maguire look like they're battling it out for that, that position in defense as well. So some really intriguing times at Manchester United. But I still, I'm not, Nick, I know what you think about this. I'm not going with them to get anywhere near the top four. I just don't, I think that's too big of a step this season, considering Chelsea, Tottenham, and even Arsenal, where they're at. But I can see United easily finishing in the top six, but I think that's just too big of a step this season. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I I, I, I can see it exactly how you're saying it. And yet in my head, there's a part of me that says we've seen crazier things and what we talked about a couple of weeks ago has kind of stuck with me, really, that that second season, um, that jump that we could see from Sancho. Let's not forget that for two seasons, he was one of the only players in the top five leagues to be carrying double digit goals and assists. And that's special. I mean, the people who do that are your Messi's, your Mbappe's, your De Bruyne's. And I just think he's going to have the chance to unlock something. It may end up being that perhaps he is not the same fit for the Premier League that he is in the Bundesliga. We've seen that before. But I I think even if that's true, there's still a level he's going to find this year that he wasn't able to find last year for a number of reasons, not the least of which to be the managers who were ended up fighting for their jobs and not maybe letting a a talented piece find its way. And also, Hmm. it'll be interesting to me, what happens if you've got Ronaldo, who's a little little shaky and, and where he needs to be, mentally and what happens when martinez and Varane are the two players playing next to each other how does a harry Maguire, who by all accounts is beloved in that room how does he react to that yeah. if he's the odd man out definitely interesting times at manchester united of eric ten hogs rebuild and talking about rebuild Mikel arteta has rebuilt arsenal over the last few years that's the next team we're going to focus on here because they've had a wonderful pre-season andy i mean scored goals galore big wins Hammered Chelsea in Orlando, just smashed Sevilla as well. Gabriel Jesus looks like the best signing of the summer, potentially, with <laughs> the goals he's scoring in preseason. So is this a season that they do finally finish back in the top four? Because they came ever so close last season and they've improved, it looks like, at least on paper. Yeah, I, I think there's an opening for them this season if you kind of look around the rest of the big six and, and preseason uh, I'll, I'll tell you from a little bit of experience, is typically the time for optimism in North London. It, it tends to go downhill pretty quickly thereafter. Uh, but right now, I think that, that there's a lot of reason for optimism. Uh, aside from the final three games of the season last year for Arsenal, it was a massive step forward. Had they been able to get into the Champions League and then unlock that next tier of players that would have been available to them, the, the, the type of players that they chased, went after and then ultimately did not get and went to clubs uh, either in the Champions League or just with a slightly higher profile than them. Uh, so I, I can see them taking another big step forward. It, I still have some of the same kind of questions that I do about uh, Manchester United as, as well. Where is, I think, the defensive stability going to come from? We know the names going forward. We know what they can do in possession. They have really shown it this preseason. Uh, but there's still a bit of that uh, lacking, lacking someone to take 
the game or the team or, or a teammate or, or, or the situation, whatever, what have you, uh, by the scruff of the neck and take control of a moment. Because that's where it seems to slip away for Arsenal is in moments. Yeah. It's not about prolonged periods. It's not about even games. It's about small moments, uh, I think, of having the maturity, of having the leadership. And I think that's the next step forward for this team this season. And as those young players age into closer to their prime years i guess we won't even say that they're into them yet uh i think that they will they'll start to evolve and i think uh just have a more solid foundation to build on so i i think this is a top four season for arsenal i really do they're a good young team as you mentioned there a lot of really good young players odegaard saka martinelli smith throw and then you bring in someone like gabriel jesus to finish off those chances that they've been creating yeah. It, it bodes well, and they have got better defensively, to be fair to them, over last season, especially with Ramsdale, Tommy Asu, Ben White coming in. The, the end of the season kind of just clouds everyone's memory, but generally over the course of the campaign, they were much improved defensively. Nick, moving on to Tottenham across North London. Superb off-season for them. The additions really strengthened the squad, obviously, with Charleston, Perisic, Basuma coming in. I'm going to ask you, because I'm, I'm going to put this question to Andy in a minute, but... <laughs> A title bid is that on the cards for Tottenham? Are we being getting above our station here? Because they look like, on paper, if Son and Kane are firing all cylinders, the only team that can really challenge Man City and Liverpool for the title this season. Is that a fair assessment? <laughs> is your manager Antonio Conte? I mean, I don't mean to sound crazy, but this looks like as much of a Conte team as we've seen at Chelsea oh, yeah. or Inter Milan. And in fact, there are shades of that Inter Milan team that that did. I mean, that was history. That was Scudetti history there, running, ending this row of championships. And my question will be, is do they have the depth in the back? Um, mm. and, and they might. I'm not saying they don't. But when you looked at Inter Milan, there were these towers that you could just trust to get the job done. When you look back at Chelsea there. So it's awesome to be a Spurs fan and to look and think, wow, our midfield, look at this depth. Wow, our attack, look at this depth. The goalkeeper to me is still probably should get praised more every season for how consistent he generally is in Lloris. But what is that back three going to function? It should be better because it's got a half season of uh, togetherness between itself, but is it going to be good enough to out out gun or hold down the guns of your man cities and your Liverpool's Andy as a Spurs fan. What do you think, mate? Is this the year that they could, could challenge and get back right at the top or would you just be happy of another top four finish and to build again yeah i i can't quite bring myself to answer that question with a yes i i think that it's the best opportunity that they have had uh even if you go back to the couple of seasons yeah. where they they went close uh to the title and finished second or third they had no business being there they the the the, the, the squad if you look at the squad from those teams i think you really start to get a sense of how much Maurizio Pochettino overachieved while he was at Spurs given the resources uh that he was given by Daniel Levy um and i think that's one reason why he's so beloved and and why Spurs fans were so sad to see him go wanted him back etc cetera, etc cetera. but nick brings up the, the i think the really the only point that matters Antonio Conte is your manager. You have a chance uh, because he is someone who, uh, to Nick's point, he didn't have the most talented team in Italy when he broke that reign, but he did it anyway. He he has this almost cult of personality where he gets people, he gets players to buy in. They want to play for him. They want to make Antonio Conte happy because he just has – there is something about him that inspires and motivates players in a way that not a lot of other managers get. And, and I'll go back to a point that I said, I think, at the end of the of last season, uh, just in general about clubs. If you have a special person in charge, you can be, for as long as that special person is in charge of your club, a special club. And I think that Spurs have one of the handful, maybe three in the Premier League right now, of those managers. There's only 10, a dozen or so around the world at a given time. And I think they've got one. So they've got an opportunity. I don't think they'll quite have the depth in the back. That is the, the weakness spot. If there's still a signing to be made, I think it'll be there. Um, and that could determine whether they're just third or fourth or if they're actually in the mix with those big two. And talking about a London club of a special manager, Chelsea, Thomas Tuchel, a lot of upheaval over the summer, new ownerships come in, lost a lot of key players. I mean, Christiansen and Rudiger have gone. Um, obviously, Aspilicueta and Alonso may move on. Lukaku's left. Not a great off-season in terms of results as well. Two cools already been talking about sort of the mentality, the intensity after that big defeat to Arsenal on their US preseason tour. And also they've missed out on a lot of big targets as well. When you look at Jules Kunde, Rafinha going to Barcelona, they keep going for players that other teams have beaten them for. 
Nick, what do you think about Chelsea? Because it looks like potentially they could be right on the verge of losing their spot in the top four. It looks like trouble's brewing a little bit, but they have signed the likes of Koulibaly and Raheem Sterling, experienced quality players at the international level who've been there and done it and won trophies. So what do you think about Chelsea? It really seems like a 50-50 situation right now, doesn't it? It does. I wonder what's going to happen if things don't go well at the start. And the, the reason you look at that is they are a bit removed from super glory, right? This this Champions League honeymoon. I think Rudiger was a bigger piece of what they do than a lot of us realized, especially because for about a year, we didn't seem really utilized in a good way at all, or half a year, I should say, at least. So here's the thing. What are they going to look like when Thomas Tuchel's dealing with this next batch of adversity, which we know is going to come because it does feel like it's not going to take long for Lukaku to find his footing over in Italy. Um, (laughs) And when that happens, it's going to be like, well, why couldn't you get this guy to score? Because about a year ago, plus a month. So about 11 months ago, what were we saying? This guy looked like for a couple of weeks, Mm -hmm. the key piece, he looked like what was going to complete the puzzle and make them part of a battle. And when you look at that cog, or that question mark, or that variable, I think that center forward variable, you know, with all due respect to what they're going to get from Sterling and Havertz, who I'm excited about. um, Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's one. I think we can all agree. Lukaku's going to score over in Italy. Yeah. Um, And and it's going to be hard to avoid that. No, definitely. And I think defensively in midfield, Chelsea are pretty solid generally. And it's all about the personnel they have up there. Is it the personnel that's the problem or the formation and the system under Thomas Tuchel? I think we've seen enough now to suggest it's probably a bit of both. They haven't found the right fit and combination, but also Chelsea in the run of play sometimes just a bit laboursome in terms of the way they move the ball and a bit predictable in the final third. So they need to find some kind of spark this season and I'd be intrigued to see who they pick up uh, late in the window. Focusing on now on the title favourites, Liverpool came so, so close to winning the Premier League title last season i think they're building up quite nicely to the the new campaign lads i mean darwin nunez scoring in the community shield final win looking sharp mohammed salah has re-signed on the long-term contract which is a big boost for them over the off season andy do you think revenge is in the air uh, for jürgen klopp and liverpool when it comes to battling man city for the title because yes they've lost sadio mane but aside from that liverpool pretty much the same team so can they do it and can they go one step further and actually win the title this season yeah, revenge is certainly on their mind. I don't know if it's in the air or or on the cards, as they say, but uh, I, I think it's going to be another long title race between these two because if you look at kind of the, the off seasons, the transfer windows that they've had, a lot of similarities going on. Both of them obviously bringing in a, a new big name, uh, potentially, hopefully for their sake, superstar striker. They both lost a pretty important piece there along uh, the attack as well. Raheem Sterling, we should mention, going to Chelsea. Uh, and, then, and then you've obviously got Mane going to Bayern Munich. Liverpool already had the replacement. They obviously made the signing of Luis, Luis Diaz in January with, with knowing uh, for what was probably to come this summer, whether it was going to be Salah, whether it was going to be Mane, someone was going to go. I think they probably made the right call keeping Salah. I think the influence that he has on the team is just greater uh, than anything that Mane does. Obviously, we know how good he is from the penalty spot uh, for them over the course of a season. And so um, the the question for me with Liverpool, because I, I don't, at this point, I don't think we can really question much of what Pep does because I think he's, at least in the Premier League, let's say, I think he's got enough uh, of a track record and a body of work at this point that we can trust that whatever adjustments he's going to have to make or Holland is going to have to make, that they will get that done and taken care of. But I have a question with Liverpool. Same position as the other two questions I've had so far. Defensive midfield, I'm starting to get a little bit... Jordan Henderson is getting on just a little bit. He's been playing a little bit further forward. Fabinho is very injury prone. And so I just wonder, you know, do they have the depth in the middle of the park? And that's been an issue for them for a couple of seasons, and they've just managed to get by. So uh, I'm going to be keeping an eye on that for sure. Yeah, it's a really good point. Naby Keita, Oxlade Chamberlain, some of the players they really lean on there were were missing for large chunks for the last few seasons. So, yeah, going to be intriguing. I think Liverpool are going to be there right at the end of the season, just like they always seem to be of Man City, uh, season after season now. And Nick, talking about Man City, adding Erling Haaland, Calvin Phillips, Alvarez, they're all looking good. Um, even that miss for Haaland in the Community Shield, uh, we're not really reading into that too much. He's going to score a lot of goals. But do you think losing the likes of Zinchenko, Gabriel Jesus, Sterling, Fernandinho, how much 
of an impact is that going to have? And a Man City still, rightly so, the favourites for the title right now. They are the favourites with the bookies, but is it really close between them and Liverpool? Or do you think City, it's still their title to lose? It's still their title to lose, but the margin is as thin as it's ever been. And I'm talking like um, in in respect to a a figure who just passed that scene in Goodfellas where he's got to slice the garlic just so thin so it melts into the sauce. That's what we're talking about here. It really, to me, if you made me pick right now, I'd be like, I don't know, goal difference head to head. But there's still something to me in in solving problems and that that Pep Guardiola has been able to do. He has almost always, except when his team gets eliminated from the Champions League, had the right things to say, at least outward facing, to assuage how everybody's feeling. The question that I have with City is about if they have to chase it this year. Um, well, that might be a little bit better for them, right? That they have to have a target and have something to chase because a lot of their players will be going to the World Cup. A lot of them will be playing on World Cup favorites even. Um, and also, who is the personality that's going to step forward? Because we know th- those names you all mentioned carry something else in common. Fernandinho, Raheem Sterling. These are big-time guys that people tended to rally around. And maybe not the fireballs that we've seen when you look at their three best players right now, in my opinion, besides Holland, De Bruyne. Rodri, Diaz, yes, of course, fiery competitors, but not necessarily that sort of magnet that draws everyone together. Mm-hmm. So I think the only danger for them is, um, well, Liverpool goes 38-0, or you know that that they have some time to figure out who is the new nucleus, who is that new yeah. driving force for their team. I have two big things on Man City. Number one, how does signing Erling Haaland impact their style of play? I still think they're better with a false nine in a lot of situations. Uh, We saw that last season. How many times the last few seasons we said, oh, if only they had a a proper number nine, they would have finished off that ball they cut back to the six-yard box and nobody was there. But I I think in the run of play, a lot of the times they're better being fluid in the movement and it just suits them better. But Haaland will score a lot of goals. That's fine. But how does he slot into that sort of ecosystem, right, of the midfield and attack there that's just so fluid? And the other big question is at centre-back. If Diaz or Laporte, who have both had a lot of injury problems uh, the last season or two, if they go down, Nathan Ake, is he the next man up? Is he really someone you can rely on uh, through four or five months of a season if you have to, to help you win a title? I'm not sure. I think they need an extra player there. But what we are sure about is there's going to be a very exciting season coming up uh, over at Pro Soccer Talk on NBCSports.com. We'll keep you updated with all this latest team news, how to watch information and analysis of this battle to finish in the top four and win the title. So excited for this, lads. It is going to be one heck of a race at the top of the table. Now let's focus on a bit further down the table, focus on some of the European hopefuls, which teams might want to sneak into the Europa League, have dreams of European qualification. Such a big deal for them, attracting players for the next season, getting extra revenue, and just having... That aura being we're a European team, we are going to be playing midweek. And and that is a lot for, that is a big deal for a lot of these teams in the Premier League. And it's quite close. There's a lot of teams we've seen swapping around those spots in the last few years. And I'm going to start, Nick Mandola, with your beloved Newcastle United. They're superb finish to last season. Sven Botman's coming at centre-back. They spent big on him. It looks like they may spend big late in the window. Do you think they can keep that positive momentum going? And do you think they can challenge for seventh, top eight spot because everybody thinks that Eddie Howe is going to do that. You look at the the betting markets and there's a lot of money on Newcastle to maybe sneak into that top six or seven conversation. Are you that confident about Newcastle this season? I'm not that confident, but I am (laughs) confident. And the reason is mostly because, and you guys know I had a a love, 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 but I wish he wasn't our manager relationship with Steve Bruce. And they have a manager now. And the fact of the matter is, I say it that way because I'm not telling you Eddie Howe is a genius, but he's an actual manager. He's got a plan here. And the collection of talent, half of what happened last year that made them better, obviously they bought Bruno Guimaraes, who's incredible. I mean, just a very good player. I think he'll continue to make his mark. But really, the pieces were being put in real soccer places. (laughs) They were really being put in places to succeed. And they will be a lot better. I also like that for, you know, of course, being that Newcastle was the nouveau reach, they were linked with a lot of names that there wasn't really any smoke behind them. But any name that there was has been a smart one. Ashworth uh, coming over from Brighton has has mm. made a, pushed a lot of the right buttons. And even now when they're talking about a Werner loan or they're talking about buying 
Maxwell Cornet uh, from from Burnley for 15 million. They're not being drawn out to these crazy prices that we thought. So they've addressed center back. They've addressed center mid. They've addressed goalkeeper when they had a pretty good goalkeeper to start with. And if they can get that front three humming, there's reason to think they will absolutely be in the discussion. Um, it's just a matter of is it too soon against these teams like West Ham and Leicester and Brighton who have gone through the battle a little bit now and who have had that experience. I have a colleague from the hockey side of things who always say the playoffs are a process. When you get into the playoffs, you have to experience them before you really start and make a run, unless you're an MLS. And this is my question here is the process here for Newcastle. I think at some points there will be some growing pains because all these players came here expecting to play in Europe. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, Trippier coming in, Nick Pope's a great sign. And it's kind of just that next tier of players and they're building slowly and steadily to be a Leicester, be a West Ham, be in that rung of clubs just underneath the top six. And they're looking looking very set, especially with some of the attacking players. Callum Wilson, St. Maximin, Almiron's looked really good in uh, preseason. So, yeah, it's going to be a good season on Tyneside. I definitely think so. Um, going down to the other end of the country, Brighton down the south coast, Andy. Mm-hmm. I mean, they'd lost Eve Basuma. They're battling to keep Mark Kukurea, which looks like he might go to Chelsea. Some big losses there, but you'd think they'd maybe be able to reinvest that and maybe some better additions up top, which is where they've struggled the last few seasons, actually put away the copious amount of chances they create game after game. If they could be more clinical, I mean, they're lovely to watch. Brighton could be a team that really breaks into the top six or seven, right? I mean, on paper, we look at their body of work over a season. There are very few, few reasons to say why they cannot finish in the European spots. I know this is going to be unpopular amongst us, Whoa. just the three of us here. Okay. But I think I think there's always a lot of teams that have the potential to do that. And I think we kind of talk ourselves into some of them and Brighton probably being an example of having a better chance to do that than they really do simply for the way that they play, because it is fun to watch. It is aesthetically pleasing. It is the right way to play. It is good possession. It's good football. But if you don't have one of those kind of clinical strikers, a, a goal scorer, it doesn't even have to be a striker. It could be Mohamed Salah who plays off of one of yeah. the wings. But if you look up, go around Europe and go around the Premier League, especially the teams in contention for that have uh, just an identifiable who is the man up top and they don't have that. And I don't know how a club of their size with their resources is going to, you have to almost unearth who's going to be the next, you know, breakout star, maybe like an Ismail Asar from a few years ago when he came over, made his way to Watford. It seemed like they might have one on their hands and he might still kind of be that type of player, but you need, you need to hit on someone that you're not supposed to, I think um, at, at one of those goal scoring positions. And so I just, it's, it's going to be the same thing again this year. It really is. It's going to be really good stuff from Graham Potter's team because that's just what they do. And we're going to have the same conversations in September and October and probably January and March. Just, this season could have been so much more with just a little bit more. And I think that's that's just kind of their fate. And I think that's a great fate to have to be pretty comfortably every season, a mid-table Premier League side, uh, even if you don't really have a realistic opportunity of making that next step forward. Yeah, Brighton established a mid-table. I think they're going to make a big push for Europe this season. Uh, We love potable here at PST. (laughs) Leicester City, no new arrivals as of yet. Kasper Smeichel looks like he might move on. Yuri Tielemans, Wesley Fofana, James Madison are attracting big bids. I mean, this is a big few months for Leicester, right, Nick, in terms of the project under Brendan Rodgers. Obviously, they won the FA Cup. They've gone far in Europe. For a club of their size and the resources, it almost feels like they've hit their ceiling and they're a bit lost and they're just wandering around trying to figure out what's next. So if they lose those players, unless they're actually a team that could, in theory, drop out of European contention and just be, you know, in mid table or maybe even further down. Do, what are we expecting from the Foxes this season? Yeah, the worry with them is the same worry that I might have for a, for a Brighton or a number of these teams where a very good player or two or three becomes four, becomes five. And look, they've, they've, they've signed smartly. And Andy and I talk about this all the time when we, we kind of text, oh, Lester's interested in this player. They must be a good player. The identification is key. Mm. But I just kind of look around and how many of these players are not disillusioned, but a little distracted, a yes. little off of their goals. Also, I don't mean to cut this short, but guys, is Jamie Vardy going to be able to keep running that much forever? He might be an alien. He's fueled by like 
Twinkies and rocket fuel. But I, I start to wonder at some point, um, this is a big task for yeah. Brendan Rodgers, and this is why they signed him and a big test of his medal. Yeah, I mean, Vardy, I think it's vodka soaked Skittles. Is this usually That's what it was, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's big. They can't keep expecting him to perform miracles week in, week out, can they? So I do worry about Leicester a little bit this season. Andy, West Ham United um, spent big in the summer. Uh, a guard's been hurt in preseason, their big centre-back arrival. So that that hurts West Ham massively. Mm-hmm. That's an area where they needed to upgrade. But Skamaka coming in from Sassuolo, Italian international striker. They spent big on another striker once again, West Ham. I mean, this is a solid unit. They've managed to keep it together. Declan Rice is still around. But what do you think they can do this season? I guess it all depends on how seriously they're going to take the conference league, right? If they don't take it that seriously, I can see them being in and around the top six, maybe even the top four again, because they are a horrible team to play against. And like Nick mentioned earlier, they've got the experience of having these top six push season after season now. Yeah, I, it's interesting you bring up the recruitment because I think it ties together nicely the point on Lester there that Nick made. And, and while I was really high on the signings they made last summer, I think they missed on most of them, at least in year one. And maybe it's a bounce back time. And it feels like West Ham, anytime they go for a big money signing, it feels like those are the ones that they get wrong. And those are the ones you can't get wrong if you're going to push to try to you know, put yourself into the conversation for those top spots in the Premier League. Obviously, they've hit on uh, you know, much m- more bargain signings like Jared Bowen bringing him in, but Saeed Ben Rama is probably going to leave the club for next to nothing. They spent 30, 40 million on him just a couple of years ago. Uh, Sebastian Allaire, who uh, you know, had a very brief stint at the club before being moved on as well. It just feels like, and maybe it's that position, it's obviously hard to find those elite goal scorers because everybody wants them and there's so few of them to go around, but they have to start hitting on their big signings if they're going to make that next step. Otherwise, they're just a little bit more defensive. Uh, you know, they're, they're the David Moyes version of what Brighton are under Graham Potter is they're going to be a solid team and they'll be tough to beat, but they'll beat themselves enough times in a season that they can't realistically, I think, be, you know, can be considered uh, a threat for one of those top six spots. Absolutely. It's going to be interesting, though, to see which team can break in and qualify for Europe from that batch of teams. And over at Pro Soccer Talk and NBCSports.com, we'll keep you updated with all the latest news from those European hopefuls. Previews, how to watch information, team news. We'll have you covered with every single game they play this season in the Premier League. Focusing now on some of the mid-table battlers, that group of teams who may not qualify for Europe but should be well clear of relegation trouble. Let's let's get into this now. I want to focus on some teams who are pretty fun to watch. Nick, I'm going to come to you. Aston Villa, Steven Gerrard. We love a bit of Stevie G here at PST. They've had some big signings early in the summer at centre-back in central midfield as well. He's very demanding as a manager, so um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how they come out of a Steven Gerrard pre-season. I'd imagine very, very fit indeed. But what is a good season for Aston Villa, given that he kept them up very comfortably last year? But the season fizzled out a little bit, right? So I don't really know what the ceiling is for this Villa team. Yeah, I think part of that is a little bit of emotional burnout. Um, They had to rebound from a manager that they very much liked. And then they got this guy to come in, an England legend, who obviously lit a fire underneath them. But after some time, I think you you kind of fizzle and you look around and you say, look, we want to play well and we want to keep racing up towards the top of the table but we know we're not going to catch there and we're not going to get there i think they needed a hard reset they needed the summer off um the question for me is with as many talented scorers as they have or playmakers as they have can they get enough scoring done um and can they get it out of ollie watkins can they get it out of these um guys who are are tasked with putting the ball in the back of the net Mm. because otherwise i think aston villa have all the ingredients to move forward. Uh, I did think it was a kind of weird to see Tyro- Tyrone Mings lose his captaincy. He played it off a little bit, um, basically saying that everybody agrees that John McGinn is an excellent leader. But they do have a number of players who I think sit on maybe the precipice or the tipping point, and they can either be very good players or they can hinge and, and move a little bit closer towards great. If a couple of those swing towards great, then I think Villa is talking about being a top six competitor on the outskirts again i don't think they'll get there i think the big six are all ahead of them but it just takes a couple funny bounces or an injury somewhere else uh to put villa right in that discussion one thing about villa i think the world cup impacts them positively more than maybe any other team in the premier league because you have ollie watkins you have coutinho danny ings tyro mings a lot of players there who are battling to play or be in the squad uh for their nations at the world cup so keep an eye out for that Mm vasta villa but I think they should be comfortable mid-table. And 
will be really close, I think, to pushing into the European spots if they start well and build up some positive vibes under Gerard. Andy Brentford, I know that's a club close to your heart as well. Uh, some smart sign-ins this offseason. Aaron Hickey coming in, Ben Mee, Keen Lewis Potter, that same model of young players proving themselves and then a bit of experience with me as well just to help them out mm -hmm. defensively. Do we worry about Brentford after losing Christian Eriksen? They were so good in the second half of last season after that wobble in the middle. Could they get sucked into a relegation battle or do you think they'll be sitting pretty in mid-table? Nope, I think they'll be just fine. Uh, th had they not had half the starting lineup out for three months um, midway through the season last season, they would have been uh, very comfortable in mid-table for the entirety of the season. They might have been pushing top seven or top eight, uh, I think, just given the start that they had and the quality. It it's, it's such a transferable style, the way that they play coming up from the championship to the Premier League. It gives teams fits. We saw what they did to Arsenal on, on the opening day of the season. They did it to a number of the big six teams over the course of the year. Now, maybe they lost some of those games, but they were one of the toughest opponents, and, and I, th I think they were a handful of managers um, around the Premier League that, that gave quotes uh, something to that effect yes. that we could not believe how difficult they were to play against. I think Ivan Tony had such a uh, comeback down year because I think so much focus was on him last year. I think he'll probably bounce back a little bit. But the name that I'm really keeping an eye on because of the way he finished last season, the way he's looked in preseason this year, and he's just now aging into being 22, 23 years old, is Brian Mbomo. He has been a really dynamic kind of second attacker playing off of Tony. Their combination play after two or three years together now is really, really good. There's just so much to like about what Thomas Frank has done. And I think it's one of those systems where you can just about plug in anyone. Uh, it doesn't matter how much quality you drop. I, I think that they can they can steady the ship um, in, in most cases without too many injuries all hitting at once. And Brentford are an easy team to root for, right? Lovely stadium, great story, good set of players and a good manager as well. Got a clear philosophy and just the culture as a club. It's a, a great story to see them. I mean, the second season syndrome, I think a lot of people are going to be talking about that, right? Had they been figured out? But like you said, Andy, they missed a lot of big players, goalkeeper David Raya being out and some of their key defensive players for big parts of last season. I think they'd be just fine. Nick, Crystal Palace, we love Patrick Vieira. What a great manager. What a great first season he had at Selhurst Park, but not a great pre-season pre generally. I mean, they were impacted by players not being allowed to travel to Australia because of travel requirement issues. Chris Richards, though, we are excited about that. Him coming in uh, for the Eagles, having an American on the books there in South London. What do we expect from Palace this season? Because it will be tough to match what they did, but lovely style of play, had a great run in the FA Cup, and were never really in any relegation trouble at all last season. So more of the same from Vieira? A little bit. This may look a little bit like a Palace of about three years ago. Um, they've refreshed, obviously, the squad coming going back to two years ago last summer at this time we're talking about them having like four guys on the roster something crazy small number like that i think this will be a little bit more of a defensive side um they bring in ducore they spent a lot of money on him they bring in richards um Gwe, he's been been very good uh but there's one name missing right and that's their star last year who came on loan and and that's something that we'll be monitoring for some time is this something that they can trigger forward um and 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 find yeah. that playmaker, find that electric piece because uh, I mean Connor Gallagher was exceptional last season. Oh, good. He, he he really captured our imaginations. Everything that we thought Billy Gilmore might be able to do at Norwich, obviously they're not the exact same player, but Gallagher did as the lone star for Palace. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how they fill that considerable void of Connor Gallagher being back at Chelsea. Wolves, I mean, rounded up the teams on the mid table battlers here. Who knows with them? I really have no idea. They finished last season so poorly. Don't score a lot of goals under Bruno Large. And Raul Jimenez is hurt at the start of the season as well. He went down in preseason with a couple of different injuries. So he's going to miss the opening month, it looks like. <laughs> They're tough to break down, but they have to score more. They have to have more production. And I think there's just kind of a bit of a negativity around Wolves after that incredible rise up to the Premier League in the Europa League. And then... They had a great start to last season, right? After a bit of a slow start, they played well, got some great results, and then it just fizzled out. And I do worry about them a little bit. I feel like Bruno Lars, if they have a poor start to the season, I think the fans could turn on them quite quickly at Wolves because they're not impressed with the style of play. And, and it wasn't always the best under Nuno Espirito Santo, but they were winning a lot of games, and that papers over a lot of cracks. But Andy, anything on Wolves that we should be looking for this season? 
No, I'll just be very quick and say there could be some regression coming. Uh, they conceded 43 goals last season. It's a pretty good defensive record for a season. Their expected goals against was over 60, though. Um, yeah. And so if you outperform by that much, it, it feels like there's regression coming. And so they're going to have to counterbalance that with more goals scored at one end, which maybe they'll do. But I don't know who like the second true attacker is playing off of Raul Jimenez. Yeah, true. I mean, but then there's a few players there. But, but no one that really stands out. And I think, obviously, Jose Sarr had a wonderful season. That's why those stats show that he saved so many clear opportunities. And they're going to need him to do that again, I think, to be in mid-table and away from any kind of relegation trouble. But here at PST, we'll keep you updated on all the latest news from those teams in the middle of the pack. Team news, how to watch information all season long. We'll keep you covered on every single one of their games. We'll be keeping a close eye on them because we're not quite sure what's going to happen with some of those teams we have just mentioned there. Okay, gents, let's now focus on the relegation candidates. Which teams are set to battle to stay in the Premier League? Nick, I'm going to come to you. Nottingham Forest, they're back in the Premier League for the first time since 1999. We're all really looking forward to this. They made so many new signings, 13 new signings, the likes of Dean Henderson coming in uh, on loan as in goal. It's a really good signing, I think. Jesse Lingard coming in as a free agent. There's been a lot made of that. I mean, can they be the surprise package? Because they've also got like basically a brand new team under Steve Cooper. But they caused some upsets last year in the FA Cup. They were really good uh, against Arsenal and Leicester knocking them out. Lost in the quarterfinals to Liverpool. And just as soon as Cooper came in last season, they went from being relegation candidate in the championship to going all the way up the table and nearly sealing automatic uh, promotions. So this seems like a team that if they started well, maybe like Brentford last season, they could surprise a few people. Yeah, this, the, the answer is yes. Um, that doesn't mean that they won't be in a relegation fight, of course, but if your answer is the conditional, is this a team that can be the surprise package? Yes, I do like it. My big question for them, I think they bring brought in some really good players, including Nico Williams is a little bit under the radar. Mm -hmm. Omar Richards could also be under the radar. But um, Bryce Samba was very, very good for them. They had Ethan yeah. Horvath behind him. Uh, they made some big, big time, timely saves. Is Dean Henderson... Um, the real deal. We've seen him shine at Sheffield United, but uh, I'll be watching him closely because he's going to step into some big shoes. Another newly promoted team, Andy Bournemouth. They're back in the Premier League after a couple of years away. Scott Parker, he's there. He's done a good job. He's now brought Fulham and Bournemouth up from the championship in his first three seasons as a coach. He's up against it, though, again, I think. Dominic Solanke, if he can score goals, obviously great to see David Brooks back after his illness and a full recovery. Those are the two key attackers you'd look at thinking maybe they can keep Bournemouth up, but it's going to be a tall order for the Cherries, isn't it? Tall, 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 tall order. 63 career Premier League appearances for Dominic Solanke, four career Premier League goals. He's got 86 appearances in the championship over the last couple of seasons for Bournemouth, where he scored 44 goals. I think you've got a championship striker that you're pinning your hopes on staying in the Premier League on. And so it, it, it I don't know how else to put it. It's going to be a long season for Bournemouth. I really do believe so. It's good to see him back, though. Kind of a fairy tale story. I know they have a wealthy owner, but it's still fighting against the odds. Smallest stadium in the Premier League by a considerable margin. Just over 11,000 fans down there on the South Coast. And, you know, they could upset a few teams. Scott Parker, good young manager. I think he'll end up going to a decent-sized Premier League team in the future. He's shown enough for me, organization-wise, that he deserves a bigger gig in the future. But I think the resources that he has there, the signings they made this summer, kind of suggest that they're going to be kind of a Norwich. They know where they lie in terms of just too good for the championship, not quite good enough for the Premier League. But let's see what happens. Fulham, that's a yo-yo team that has ever won in recent years. Two uh, relegations, three promotions in their last five seasons. Marco Silva's done a really good job. Uh, they won the championship at a canter last year. Mitrovic banging in goals for fun, setting that that new record for goals in a single season in England's second tier. But Silva has been having a pop at the ownership and saying, look, we only have two first-team centre-backs. What's going on? We need new players in and we need it fast. And Silva, a bit of an abrasive character during his time at Watford and Everton in the past. Nick, what do we expect from Fulham here? We, we love Fulham America, by the way. Look, Really looking forward to going to Craven Cottage down by the banks of the River Thames. Tim Ream, Anthony Robinson cheering them on. But again, for a newly promoted team, this seems like another tall order and Fulham just understanding that they're going to have to spend big again, and maybe they were burned by doing that in the past. Was it the summer of 2018 when they spent loads of money and it did not work out at all? 
Yeah, and that year they also bought players who turned out to be good in other places, um, yeah. in, including Zambo and Guisa, who's, who's, I think, a very, very nice player. Big question for me with Fulham is I think they're going to be able to whip in service to Mitrovic. I think he can score yes. a bunch of goals. He'll be better. He didn't have that at Newcastle. And um, the question is, can he stay out of the books? Can he, can he not get sent off two or three times? But Fulham, uh, toss it in the air. I mean, it's a coin flip to me whether or not that they're – uh, they're able to stick around. And and that's a weird feeling because I, I kind of liked them at the outset when they made that spending in 2018. Yeah, and you know what? The last time we were in the Premier League as well, they were decent in spells. And you felt like maybe this time they are a bit more experienced, some of those group of players. And they've got some good young attacking players there. But yeah, it's going to be t- a tough ask to, for them to stay in the Premier League. Um, Andy, a team that just stayed in the Premier League on the final day last season, Leeds <laughs> United, Jesse Marsh somehow kept them up, but they have lost two key players in Rafinha and Calvin Phillips over the summer. And it's down to two American players he knows very well and Brendan Aronson and Tyler Adams to come in and fill those significant voids. Do you think they can do that? Because that's a tall order for those young American players. And it seems like Jesse Marsh needs to get off to a fast start to get these Leeds United fans believing that he is the right man long term to stabilize them as a Premier League team. Yeah, I don't think they need to replace what they did, um, you know, with the new signings coming in and, and and the stars leaving. I think it's going to be a much more kind of committee approach from Leeds this season where you don't have, obviously you don't have a standout talent, the player that you can look at and say, this is clearly the best player in the squad. It's a big squad, by the way. It's, a, it's way too big for how many games that Leeds are going to have this season without any European competition. Obviously, I think they're going to have to trim some down just a little bit. I like that they got their their business done, their, at least their incoming business done early. And so they've had players in for the full preseason. I think Jesse Marsh is going to have had time to drill everything in. I, I think they'll be fine. I might even go so far as to say that I think we have them in the wrong tier uh, for the preview mm-hmm. section. I, I think they could be fairly comfortable um, if you know, this is yeah. I, it's too simple to say that it all hinges on Jesse Marsh and, and the way that the team buys into what he wants. But I really do think it's about that because he has all the pieces that he needs uh, that he could possibly want to play the you know, play his style of football. Yeah, I think it's going to be a lot more solid sort of robust unit defensively rocker and tyler adams sitting there gives the likes of aronson and others a lot more license to go forward patrick bamford for me if he's fit the whole season we know how good of a finisher he is i think that's key to the way leads play everton tough summer for lampard losing four nil to minnesota united they lost for charleston he's already talking about relegation i mean nick on everton are they going to be in a relegation scrap again and tarkovsky and Dwight McNeil. I mean, two decent signings, but do they need more than that late in the window if they're going to stay away from the relegation? Yes, 100%. Yeah. Yes. Tough summer for Everton. Also still having Frank Lampard there. Not going to yeah. lie to you. I, I don't have any faith that this guy can be uh, someone who navigates a whole season and puts this team where it wants to be. Yeah, it's going to be tough for them. And I think it's going to be tough for my hometown team, Southampton, as well. Awful finish to last season. Signed a lot of Good players, but very young players. They've gone with a clear philosophy of going for players under the age of 21. And it's going to be tough to see if that gamble pays off for Ralph Hasenhut. One thing to look out for them, they're playing a 3-5-2 formation now, which maybe they aren't going to high press as much. Joe Aribo is their best signing of the summer by far, was a star at Glasgow Rangers. Looked really, really good. Um, So I still worry for Southampton, though. Defensively, a bit all over the place. And I think the likes of themselves, Everton and Leeds, even though they think they should be higher up the table, I think they're going to get sucked into a relegation battle and it's going to be tough. And Saints have a tough start to the campaign too. Okay, gents, that does us for this mega preview show. We focused on all 20 Premier League teams ahead of the campaign. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks everyone for watching. Remember, head over to Pro Soccer Talk on NBCSports.com for all the latest Premier League news. We'll have you covered, the three lads on the screen, on all 380 games. We'll be watching all of them between us. Cannot wait for this season to start to see who the title favourites are, if that all plays out as we expect. And the new signings as well. So many big stars, Haaland, Nunez, and so many others coming into the Premier League. So many storylines for us to talk about, gents. So all I can say is thanks so much for joining me this week for Pro Soccer Talk. Looking forward to spending the entire season with you. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Enjoy the opening weekend of the season. And we'll speak to you all on Pro Soccer Talk very soon indeed. Thanks, guys. As always, a pleasure. 
Hi there, I'm Rebecca Lowe, studio host for NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch highlights all season long and be sure to tune in for Premier League mornings every weekend at 7 a.m. Eastern. And for even more content, head over to Peacock, where we've got live games, original series and a dedicated round-the-clock Premier League channel featuring studio shows, classic matches and much more.